Okay, I think we're recording here, although I didn't actually hear the words recording, but we want to welcome everyone to um, our newest edition of Anomalies. My name is Gwen Farrell, and I will be your host today, and I'm joined by my co-host, David Jenks. How are you doing today, David? I am doing well and very excited for today's presentation by Robert, Good. our guest, who you will talk about now. Yes, I'm going to. Um, <laughs> Oh, let's get going with the fun stuff here. Uh, Dr. He has, Robert he has e. the Farrell. same name as you, too. and uh, He does, okay. and that's a, cool a pure coincidence, but mm -hmm. just good luck, I guess. So, okay. <laughs> um, our guest today is Robert E. Farrell, Dr. Robert E. Farrell. He received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Ohio State University, an MBA from Western New England College, and a Doctor of Engineering from the University of Massachusetts. He is now retired from Penn State University as Associate Professor Emeritus. Over 25 years ago, he began doing serious research for his series of science fiction novels, Alien Log, Alien Log 2, The New World Order, Alien Log 3, The Dulce Affair, and Alien Log 4, The Antarctica Affair. His research has led him to believe that there is life beyond Earth that's not only technically, but also spiritually more advanced than humans. This led him to develop his lecture and book entitled, The Science Behind Alien Encounters. In addition, he has traveled widely to research his interest and the work he has done relating to possible alien mummies found in Peru, which he's going to share with us today. I have known Robert Farrell for several years and have really been looking forward to our visit with him today. So, Robert Farrell, it's good to see you again and welcome to Anomalies. Yes. Thank you, Gwen, and, and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this interesting subject. Uh, it, I, it really needs to be talked about more, actually. Yes, okay, so we are ready to start whenever you are. Okay, so, uh, even though we're talking about mysterious mummies here, you, you should know that these bodies are not mummies. They, they're, they're bodies, they're bipedal and tridactyl, and they were living beings at one time, and they're not mummies because they, for the most part, still have their organs intact. So but I, I call them uh, mummies. People understand what I'm talking about when I say the Nazca mummies. So let's get started then. Uh, first of all, this is always my first slide when I'm talking. That's my goal in life is to reach where the point where I can give unconditional love. And there's only one that I know of who can do that, and that's my dog. <laughs> so I'm working on it. <laughs> anyway, that's me. You've already uh, put in, oh, wait a second here. Uh, what's wrong? Hold on. I have to start the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. That's okay. We can see it. Okay. So um, this should come up then. As an animation, but anyway, okay. Well, let's see what happens here. Um, anyway, so that's that's me. You, you already talked about it. I uh, I was in industry for twenty years, designing machinery, and then uh, left industry to start a program in plastics at Penn State. And I was there fifteen years. And but I've always had an interest in science and space, and especially UFOs. Um, I, I'm not sure what's going on here. Normally I have these scrolling up one at a time, but that's okay, you can use this. So I want to talk about today, uh, how I became interested in the subject matter, and also an overview of the project about these bodies that's been ongoing from 2016 and still ongoing. Um, and an overview of what's referred to as the reptilians, one of the species has been identified as being very reptilian type. Um, and I'll talk about uh, a, a biologist's uh, observations about these reptilians. And then we'll, we'll go into talking about Maria and Wawita, who are more human-like, and observations by some experts on those bodies. And at the end, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the carbon dating process and the results we have, and the DNA and material analysis on these bodies. So most of you know uh, Jaime Masson. He's the one that got me interested in this. I happened to attend a, a lecture he gave in uh, 2017, I mean, November 2017. 
uh, in New Nevada. And uh, this was the first time that anyone actually, I think, had talked about this subject, and that was Jaime. Uh, the fact that all the mummies had only three fingers and three toes, in other words, 12 digits, is what got my attention uh, because I had done a lot of research into the Sumerians to, to write my book on the science behind Noah's flood. And um, I knew 12 was an important number to, for them. So I was trying to tie in the Sumerians with, with this incidence or incidents that are occurring in Peru. Uh, this is Maria, <coughs> excuse me. And you can see that she's got 12 digits. And she's the uh, human-like body. So anyway, I, I've been looking for a connection between the Sumerians and, and uh, the mummies, if you want to call them that, um, in Nazca. And uh, it turns out that there was a, a uh, object, a bowl, that, that was found in Bolivia. Apparently, a farmer had been using that to water his goats, but somebody discovered that there was writing on it, cuneiform writing, and they rated, they dated it to be 5,000 years old. Um, so clearly there's a Sumerian connection there. How it got there 5,000 years ago, I don't know. Uh, also, there's a lot of inscriptions on rock, rocks in the area of uh, Palpa, where, where it's sort of where the bodies were found. And some artwork in that region that depicts tridactyl uh, people or beings of some kind. So the, the discovery of this, these bodies actually occurred back in 2016. Um, and this is a picture of Thierry, I, I'm probably mispronouncing his first name, but it's Thierry Jimin. And uh, he's a, a French person. He's been in the US for a number of decades, but uh, he's an archeologist. He's also the founder of uh, the Inkari Institute. And the Institute does uh, archaeological and anthropological research within the Peruvian National Territory. So it was in October of 2016 when Mario, a Waquera, who's like basically a grave robber, brought some bodies and parts of bodies to theory to find out if they were fake or not. And his main interest was hopefully that they're not fake because that would increase the, the, the value of those op of objects on the black market because that was his business. Well, anyway, Theory ex examined them and uh, came to the conclusion that they were real and probably historic. So uh, it was illegal probably for him to hold on to them. And so he decided that the best thing to do is let the people in, in power know that he has them. So on January 11, 2017, uh, he notified the Ministry of Culture that he had these unusual bodies. And he was hoping that the, the minister would respond and say, great. We'll come and get them, you know, and and we'll give them protection and all that. And so he was hoping that they might be declared as a national treasure, and that the place where they were discovered would be uh, a, a national national protected area, so that uh, grave robbers couldn't keep looting it. Anyway, uh, months later, it took months without ever even sending anybody out to examine the bodies. The minister claimed that the bodies were fake and had no interest. So now today in 2024, uh, the Ministry of Culture is still says that the bodies are fraud and, and actively pro promoting that, that idea. And I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but uh, anyway, because of the earlier response that the minister had uh, for two years, the bodies were hidden from place to place because they didn't want to be taken away by the ministry. Uh, so they were shuffled in cardboard boxes and stored here and there being hidden and in, unprotected from the environment, which was kind of sad. Um, in March 2017, a biologist uh, who was a friend of Jaime Masson contacted uh, him and, and uh, told him about these bodies and uh, the, the theory had, had uh, posted on the Internet. Well, Jaime became convinced after some discussions with theory that, yeah, they, they might be real and worth investigating. So he and Gaia began to organize a research expedition to Peru. And so they put together some teams. First teams consisted of a, a biologist, a surgeon, a radiologist, archaeologist, a forensic expert, 
some videographers and journalists. And that was the first team that went down. Uh, and these investigators were from all over, from the United States, Mexico, Peru, Russia, France, and Canada. And uh, the first team, uh, there, there are other people that, that helped out in, in this whole process that didn't go to, to Peru. You know, they, they kind of contributed from their home country one way or another. Anyway, over a two-year period between 2017 and 2019, these teams visited Peru several times. And here's a example of some of the people who were involved. Um, we had a microbiologist, Dr. Rios, I call him. I, I never know how to pronounce <laughs> these names. They have so many names, I don't know which one to use, but I'm calling him Dr. Rios. And then uh, Dr. Alfaro, he's, he's a radiologist. Uh, we have Dr. Benitez, who uh, is actually uh, attached to the Mexican Navy. He was chief of the forensic science there. And we have Dr. Salazar Vivanco, I call him Dr. Vivanco, uh, who is a medical surgeon from Cusco. Also, we have uh, someone from Russia that was involved, Dr. Konstantin Krutkov. He's a professor in, uh, at St. Petersburg University in Russia. And Doug Taylor, who's a biotechnology expert in the U.S. And M.K. Jesse, who's a radiologist uh, in the micro muscular skeletal radi radi radiologist. Um, also from Russia, we have Mitri Galetki, and uh, he's a Ph.D. M.D. professor of oral surgeon uh, in Russia. And we have then from Gaia, Jay Wiedner and Melissa Tittle. And then, of course, there's a film crew. There's a lot of other people working in the background that I just don't have enough room to talk about. Anyway, so the first trip occurred in April of 2017. Um, now, if you go down there and you want to go to Cusco, the best way is to fly into Lima and then catch another flight out to Cusco. Don't try and drive. It would be too, too long and treacherous, I think. But anyway, uh, so that's where Cusco is, and that's where the Inkari Institute is located. So here the team has got together uh, and in front of the uh, Inquiry Institute, uh, this is most of the people, some of the people in the background are the film people who run the cameras. Um, here they are, they're inside the building and they've been handed some body parts to look at. They're looking at one case here, there's some hands that we'll see later um, and some other things that they will eventually have a chance to look at, uh, including Maria, but that'll be later in the program. Whoops, sorry. Uh, here's an example of some parts that they had. They, they had skulls presented to them. They had a series of hands. Uh, they had Maria and Wawida. I didn't show her there. And uh, some, some other bodies that have been referred to as being reptilian, and you'll see why, but and this is just three of them, there's several presented. So anyway, after hours of doing their physical exam uh, and, and x-ray exam, um, they, they took samples. Now they wanted to do a DNA analysis and carbon dating. So they, they took samples for that. And both of those take a while and very expensive. And this whole project over the last six years has cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to get all these analyses done. Anyway, about three months later from the first visit, uh, they scheduled a press conference and that was held in Peru. And when they want to announce their findings, and even though they didn't have all the data yet as far as DNA information, they thought they had enough to move forward and at least let the public know this was happening. And so Jaime and all of some of the doctors that I mentioned earlier <laughs> participated in that. And here they are. Uh, this is the July 11, 2017 press conference. Uh, these, these are four of the major players in the uh, story. So the question always is, where, where'd they find these bodies? And obviously they're being kept secret. The place is, is a secret because the, the uh, grave robbers certainly don't want to uh, have people know where, where their gold mine is, but that's what it is. Um, however, during uh, in the next trip that the team made uh, about six months later, in November 16, 2018, some of the members were taken to a site that was a cave outside of uh, Palpa. 
And because it had been said before to these people that, well, we found them somewhere between Palpa and Nazca. And so here's this site that they, a few, few of them were taken to in 2018, um, where they claimed the bodies were found. And it, if we have time at the end, I'll explain what the original story was that the that Mario, the, the uh, grave robber, has, had said. Uh, and it turns out, I'm not sure which is the true story. Uh, so here they are at, on site. You can see that uh, this is a, I drew a circle between Palpa and Nazca, and it was in that region, supposedly, where the bodies were found. So these people, six people, were taken up, and you can see it was kind of rugged. They walked all the way up to, to get a, a look at a cave. This is a possible discovery. So I say a possible because I'm still not convinced it's the right one. Um, but this is where they were taken. And <clears throat> based on what they had been told earlier about how they found the bodies, uh, several of the investigators said that, well, you know, the cave smelled like the, the bodies that they had handled, um, but it, it didn't quite meet the description that Mario, Mario had given to them earlier. By the way, Mario is a pseudo name. That's not his real name. So the cave was covered with white powder the diatomaceous earth. And in the cave, Mario pointed out the locations where Mario, uh, Maria, I'm sorry, where Maria and uh, two of the, the smaller bodies were found. And here you see Theory coming out of the cave and you can see the white powder on his hands, which is diatomaceous earth. So um, three days later, after this trip into the cave, uh, they made a presentation on the, on the 19th of November in 2018 to the Congress of the Republic of Peru down in Lima. And even though the Minister of Culture had said he would be there, he was not. You can see the empty chairs. Uh, so he, uh, I guess he didn't want to show up for some reason. Maybe he was embarrassed, but he didn't show up. And uh, this is an image of the, of the presentation. On one side, you see the team of, who we dealt with the mummies, and on the other side, you see some archaeologists and and the press. The archaeologists are still insistent, even today, that the bodies are fake. And uh, you'll see as I go along how uh, they really are adamant about thinking they're fake. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. Did I miss one? No, that's it. So anyway, turns out there was enough information presented at, at the uh, the Congress that, that convinced a lot of people, including me, uh, these were real bodies. They had been alive at one time. And and unfortunately, for two years, they had been ferried around in boxes here and there, and not in a safe condition. So the rector uh, of the University of Ica boldly stepped forward and said, we'll take the bodies. We'll protect them, and we're going to do research on them. And so he deserves uh, some kind of an award for being bold, because other universities, or universities during that same two period, two year period, uh, have been approached and but declined because the archaeologists who were in their archaeology department uh, said, "Well, those are fake. You, you don't want to take those bodies. They'll give you a bad name." But anyway, uh, Vice Rector uh, Gesby was brave enough to step forward. Uh, so recently, like last year, was another hearing. This one was held before the Congress of Mexico in September of 2023. Um, it was two, two months, roughly, after we had our own convention, congressional hearing about UFOs uh, or U UAPs, any, whatever you want to call them. But uh, in both cases, both of these congressional hearings were really aimed at uh, trying to establish some kind of a protocol where people could make their reports of sightings without uh, being harassed or laughed at. Uh, and this especially it was the Air Force needed needed a way to do this. And uh, even airline pilots, you know, from the private industry. Uh, so that was the crux of uh, this particular hearing in Mexico. It was a three year long hearing. I mean, three, three, three hour long hearing. And uh, but the last hour uh, was given to Jaime and, and uh, Joyce Mantilla to to discuss these bodies, which they did. 
and they, they went through almost as much detail as what you're going to see in, in the rest of my talk. But one of the things that they posted here in their, their presentation was the, the places where they had actually gotten DNA. You can see there's a number of companies there. So they did a thorough investigation into the DNA of these bodies. And then the, below that, you can see where they had sent bodies for other analyses for carbon dating or uh, maybe a material analysis of some of the implants. So they did a good job, of uh, a, a thorough job of researching this. At the end of the, the uh, talk, though, uh, they put up this slide because they wanted to warn people that there are those people who are adamantly against uh, these, these mummies don't believe they're for real, they're fake. And they're what they do is they post these bodies, they're actually dolls, they're crude images, and claim that this is what the team is working on, and they're not. And so they made a note of this in uh, the, their hearing before the Congress, that these bodies uh, that they've studied are not fake, but someone is trying to indicate that they are fake. Oh, by the way, let me go back. At the bottom of the screen, if you go to that website, uh, you you can listen, watch the whole three hour conference, medical uh, hearing. I'm not medical, but the congressional hearing. It's a three hour long thing. Uh, Jaime and, and uh, Joyce Matilla have the last hour basically to talk about these bodies. So I want to rewind now, give you an overview, and I want to go into detail and look at some of these bodies that were found and with some, some of the work that was done. So we're gonna go all the way back to April, 2017 for the first visit. Uh, so some heads were brought out of skulls, I should say, a bodyless heads uh, uh, for them to examine. And here you can see they, they did some x-rays on them. And there's a, this one here, actually Jaime had presented in his talk in 2017. Um, some of the x-rays showed the, the, the base of the skulls uh, was kind of unusual in the sense that there's a hole in the, the hull, skull for the brain to connect to the spinal cord. And normally, in most animals, it's toward the back of the, of the skull, but also it's normally a round hole. And these holes were, were square, which is kind of unusual. Here you can see the human skull is round, but it is kind of central in the skull, and a couple of animals there. Um, this is an image of a llama skull, and the only reason I show that is because in some of my research, um, it seems that during this project, I'm talking now about a project that's lasted, what, six or seven years now. Um, during this whole period of time, some pieces of skull were sent in to be analyzed. And they were determined to be the skulls or a portion of a skull from llamas. So I thought, well, let me see what a llama skull looks like. And that's what they look like. They don't look anything like the, the heads that I just showed you. Um, so I'm not sure why pieces of those skulls ended up going in for uh, investigation. Here are the hands that were brought out on day one. There were three of them very long, almost 12 inches long. And you can see the uh, some of the material was removed from one of them. That was uh, early on, they took samples to send out for DNA and carbon dating. And also these hands had five phalanges in them, whereas we have three. So if you look at your finger and move it around, you can see, yeah, we got three phalanges. These, these had five. And probably the reason they don't need a, a thumb to pick up things is because they can wrap these fingers right around almost anything to pick it up. So they're capable of actually doing things. A couple of the hands actually had uh, implants in the back of the wrist. Um, one was kind of a gold color and the other was uh, uh, kind of a red reddish color. Uh, early on, they could determine right off the bat that, that they uh, these were non-magnetic. So that was the extent of how some of the early investigation into these things. Again, they're going to do a DNA and carbon dating on these body on these hands. So I'm going to talk now about the reptilians. These are the smaller bodies. They're only about two feet tall, and 
for, at first two of them were brought in. I, I put in here amphibians because when I describe them a little later, you'll say maybe they are classified as rap, rip, uh, amphibians. But I think I think in general people still would call them reptilians. But Josephina and Alberto were two bodies that were brought forward for them to look at, and here they are. They're only about two feet tall. They're kind of small, um, and they have long necks as you can see, and they're tridactyl. Three fingers and three toes. So, Robert, can I interrupt here just briefly? Yes. Uh, sorry to do that. I'm I'm confused though. There are hands which are, you know, big, very large. Yes. There are three of those that were presented. The hands. The hands. Yeah. yeah they, they had three hands there. Yes. And again, where? What was the origin or alleged origin of those those body parts? Uh, apparently, they were found in the same uh, cave. The same uh, cave, okay. And yeah. but there are two full bodies, these two that we're looking at here, of the smaller creatures. Were, were there any other life forms or skeletons or whatever found? Uh, well, there are several of these smaller bodies, and I'll get okay. to that. Uh, and toward the end, uh, this year, as a matter of fact, they found another one of this type, which they call the reptilian. Uh, but much larger, almost twice as long as as tall as these. But otherwise, the same structure. So this was a treasure trove of anomalous. Oh yes, it was. biology here is what it looks. They like. dug out a lot of stuff, and that's why they didn't want to reveal it because wow. I had heard I had heard uh, when I was down there uh, that Maria, the body you'll see later, had a, a price tag of a million dollars on the black market. I would think so. so. Obviously, yeah. these are. Huh. And a lot of these have already been sold off for thousands of dollars. Okay. And in fact, that might be a reason why the Ministry of Culture is so interested in, in, in tamping this down, making it look like it's fake, because they don't want people to be interested in coming to their country and taking away their heritage, you know? Okay, I see. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, here you can see them again, the same bodies. There's Jaime Masson on his, on his uh, right side is... Thierry, and then uh, Dr. Benitez is, uh, the, is on his left side. They're, they're looking at the bodies. Here's another shot of the, of the two bodies. Um, they did some x-rays, and one of the things they noticed, they both did not have teeth. They were, they, but they had uh, something, some bones in the front of their face, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but, but they did not have teeth. Uh, so the first thought was, well, maybe they had a liquid diet. But then if you look at these images, you can say, well, how could they swallow? There was no esophagus either. Um, so they can't chew and they have no esophagus. But during some of the investigation, they know the construction of the necks was such that they could be extendable like a turtle. You know, you remember E.T.? <laughs> yeah. I think that, okay, well, he had an extended neck too. Yeah. Uh, here's Dr. Benitez uh, talking about the fact that these bodies, because they had such large eye sockets, they probably had a range of vision of around 180 degrees as compared to 140 for humans. So um, they'd be hard to sneak up on, I think. So, they, so now we're going to look at Alberto. There was two bodies I mentioned, Alberto and Josephine. We'll start off with Alberto and look at some details. Here he is being examined by, by theory and some of his uh, workers. Uh, one of the things they noticed was the hip joint is not a ball and socket like ours. Um, and so they probably walked differently. Later on, they discovered after doing some computer tomography and everything that the joints tend to be uh, consist of a spongy material rather than you know ball and socket type things. And uh, so, of course, that might give them an extra degree of freedom in, as far as motion is concerned. And here's Alberto getting ready to be pushed into the MRI machine. And here's an image of him. Um, one of the things that the team had to overcome at the very beginning was the claim that these bodies were assembled from cadaver bones or animal bones of some kind, that, that these were 
manufactured, they were assembled together. And so they worked real hard to disprove that. And if you look at this image, it's really hard to, to imagine that somebody could build this. Um, and you can see the joints and the connective tissue and everything. And as we go on, you're going to see more and more evidence that these bodies at one time were living creatures. Here's a slice through the body of uh, uh, Alberto. And um, one thing to notice was, again, no teeth. He had apparently a couple of bones in the front of his face. And I'll talk more about those. And then all of them had a protruding uh, breastbone. And a really interesting part is there is no evidence inside the body, these uh, x-rays and, and computer tomography images, that there's no heart, there's no lungs, and there's no digestive system. Um, I didn't have time to put all my slides in, but one of the slides I do have shows that there is a uh, what would appear could be used as an aorta to actually pump fluid, uh, but without lungs, it would be, wouldn't have to be as complex complex as our heart, and so it could be a simple aorta because there had to be some way to to move the fluid around to uh, feed and oxidize the uh, cells. Anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. It's my thought that these uh, these creatures, as they're called, uh, got their nutrients and transpired through their skin. And I'll talk a little more about that. But um, well, in fact, I'll, right now I'll mention it. some of the people watching this video uh, may know, and also I, through my research over the years, I've read a lot about people who've encountered greys. And I know someplace along the line, I've heard several times that uh, that these greys did not eat, that they immersed in a liquid to get their energy. And so, again, that kind of supports the idea in my mind, at least, that these are mm -hmm. examples of, of the greys. Okay, so here's the, the fingers and toes of uh, Alberto. He has three phalanges, just like we do. Unusually large eye sockets with slits for nose to, to go in through uh, the skull. And side view here. Um, there's some debris inside there. I think they is, is probably dried brain. But anyway, uh, you see he has a pretty good sized cavity there. Considering his size and everything, uh, in proportion that they have quite large heads and brains, apparently. But again, notice there's no esophagus and no bronchial tube. Now we're going to look at Josephina. And she was brought out, and this is the way they kept them, is they carried them around in these cardboard boxes and hid them from the public uh, for two years. But here's uh, Josephina that was brought forward to be investigated. Uh, one of the things they noticed is she seemed to have a, a metal uh, plate, press plate, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, here it is. And it, it, it looks like they've determined that it was installed while she was alive and perhaps to help her survive because it was evidence that her collarbone had been broken and that this was probably put in place to keep things together. Here we can see uh, an X-ray of her body. You can see the breastplate uh, you can also see what appears to be eggs. In fact, that's the claim initially, that there probably were eggs. They didn't have any proof yet. Of course, the naysayers said, well, those are those are rocks that were put in there when they assembled the body. Um, anyway, the one arm is different than the other. You may notice that. And so it's theorized that uh, she had a replacement arm put on her. And maybe she was damaged. They think maybe she was attacked by a wild animal and lost the animal, I mean, lost the arm, and got replaced by a replacement arm. So there's evidence here that they had pretty sophisticated surgery. As we go along, we'll see that. Um, here is uh, the image of the head, and it was noted that there are three holes along each side of the skull that it's believed when they looked inside the skull with other computer, computer tomography images, that that was part of an auditory system so that they could hear in other words even though they apparently couldn't speak and then you see protrusions out of the skull uh, for attaching muscles and they think that would have allowed these 
features to move their head through 270 degrees. So once again, it'd be hard to sneak up on them. And here's another image. You can see the dried brain material in there. No teeth. And notice the, again, in the front of the face is these two bones instead of teeth. Um, and I'm reminded of place along the line I heard in my reading, um, and Gwen, perhaps you could support this too, that uh, these, the, the grays uh, do not uh, speak, but uh, they do make a clicking sound. The, the people have reported them making a clicking sound. So this would fit with that, that these bones perhaps are used to click because there's no way for them to pass air back and forth to make it through vocal cords. There's no lungs and there's no uh, windpipe. So we're looking again at a, a view of Josephina. Um, again, there's actually four eggs there. It looked like three, but they found a smaller one in the eustachian tube. So she has four eggs, 11 vertebrae, a metal plate, uh, an extendable neck, and a hollow bones, which we, we generally don't have hollow bones, and, and, and an amazingly small thoracic cage, uh, unlike almost any other animal. But then again, you know, if they don't have a heart or lung or digestive system like we do, uh, I guess they wouldn't need much space for anything. Here is another image, uh, a front, side, and back. And you can see the eggs through the bones there. Um, some other observations. Uh, number one, the connective tissue is more like what we see in a frog, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and notice in the forearm and the foreleg, only a single bone, where we have two bones. Um, they, their structure, their skeleton, reminds me a lot of, of a frog. In fact, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, having dissected frogs when I was in high school, I remember what they looked like. Here they are. So they seem to have, this is kind of why I threw out the word amphibian, because a frog is an amphibian. Uh, although a frog, uh, two things about a frog, most of you maybe know this, but um, a lot of people didn't know that a frog can actually transpire through its skin. And that's how they survive the winter under the ice, even though they have lungs. When they're under the, the ice and they're dormant, they are capable of taking in oxygen and giving off CO2 through their skin. And so when, I'm, when they're on land, even though they have lungs, they don't have a diaphragm, at least what, as we would think of a diaphragm. But if you can imagine a frog sitting on a lily pad, you can see his throat going up and down, up and down. That's his diaphragm. So that, that's how they breathe when they're active and when they're on, out of the water. So now we're gonna look at Maria, who is more human-like. And this is where she was brought forward. Here's the team members gathering around Maria when, when they first met her. Um, and she looks pretty small here, but actually if, if she were to stand up, she'd be about five feet tall. And uh, this is an image that shows that she for the most part, still had most of her internal organs, although she was missing some. <clears throat> and um, the, she had been, they think she had been attacked by a wild animal. I'll talk more about that. Here she is uh, covered with the diatomaceous earth. And um, I have her sideways because that's the way she was laying. She was laying on her right side and there was uh, evidence of blood mixed in with gravel underneath her right hip. Uh, where apparently she bled out. Her skull is, uh, cranium is about 20% larger than most humans. She had three fingers, as you can see here, uh, a larger eye socket than most people would have. And she didn't have the oracle. This is the flappy thing that stamp, sticks out of your side of your head. We call an ear. She didn't have one of those, but she has a hole in the side of her head so she could hear. Here's her feet, her toes. This is an x-ray of, of the feet. Again, a, a lot of these images are there to convince people that these bodies were not assembled. They were living and 
at one time and just had all the evidence of being alive at one time. So the question about Maria, because they thought she was a woman or female, and uh, it was only after doing some computer tomography images and studying those that they did find uh, some a skin uh, flap, basically, that they thought perhaps had been a mammary gland. So that would lead one to think that she was uh, a female. And, and later on, I'll, that'll be confirmed. And I'll show you. <laughs> so here's an image show the backside. They think she had, had been attacked by a, a large feline, a wild feline animal. And they actually measured the, the, the marks, the teeth marks in her back uh, to be about two inches apart. The fangs are about two inches apart. So it was a fairly good sized feline that, that attacked her and caused her death. Uh, again, you can see her fingers clearly here, three fingers. The interesting thing they found was at the end of her fingers were fingerprints. Now, human fingerprints are swirled. Hers are not. They're parallel lines, and therefore, she's clearly not humans. Here she is getting ready to run through the MRI machine. Uh, she's laying on the side where she would have been when, when she died. That's why her head is cocked to, the, to that side. Again, the same image looking back. So um, one of the people who studied this was a radiologist, uh, Dr. Raimondo Salas Alfaro. And um, you'll see some of the images that, that he produced and his comment on these images. So a slice through the body showed that she did indeed have a heart, blood vessels, and lungs. And, and uh, another slice taken further down showed that there seemed to be a hard object there that they interpreted as feces, uh, fossilized feces. And I, I show it in yellow because I think that's one of the most important things in this whole project. And I encouraged them when I went down to ICA that they actually extract that and study it because it's something that she ate probably. And later on when I talk about carbon dating, you'll see why knowing the date of that would be extremely important. So that was probably something she ate the day she died, whatever it was. So this is Dr. Alfaro, and uh, he uh, did some observations and actually conducted uh, the, the MRI uh, images that were produced here. Uh, he had 35 years of service and 25 years as a radiologist. And he said that after studying the bodies, he concluded that they had not been altered. Remember, that was the big thing at the very front of this project, is to over, overthrow this idea that these bodies were as, assembled from cadaver bones or animal bones. Uh, he said that if alterations had been made while the body was alive, the readouts would have been seen. And that if the alterations had been made after death, there wouldn't be any connecting tissue. And you wouldn't be able to regenerate. And so he concluded it's not possible to take cadaver bones and fabricate these bodies. So here's some more images of her, her body here, x-rays. Um, I was interested in her head because uh, I, I thought maybe if she had canine teeth, it might indicate that she was a carnivore. Uh, but her teeth were so bad um, that she was missing so many that, that I, you can't conclude whether she ever had kind of uh, canine teeth or not. But she did have bad teeth health. Uh, here's another tomography image slicing through her body. Uh, I find it hard to believe that she was assembled, that she didn't really live. I think she did live. Uh, there's her fingers. She had four, four bones in her finger. Again, you can see the connective tissue there, which is what you would expect. Uh, here again, you see her from a different angle. You can see her hands and three fingers. And you, you can see some of her teeth there, but no evidence of canines. These are her feet, her toes. Here's a computer tomography image slicing through her body and you can see her foot. 
uh, one of the things you may notice is she doesn't have a heel, heel bone like we do. And so someone wondered, well, if she doesn't have a heel bone, how could she possibly walk? I mean, you, first thing you put down on the ground is your heel, right? For the most part. Some people could put their toe down, but most people come down with their heel. And they didn't. she doesn't seem to have one. And uh, so how could she possibly walk? Because she doesn't have this this uh, calcaneal uh, fibrosity that we have. Well, guess what? It is possible to walk without a heel. Uh, this bird can walk fine. Doesn't have a problem at all. So she can walk around. Um, here is a forensic computer animation of Maria, at least slides from the animation. Again, you see she has no ear flaps. Uh, quite human looking, actually. She's a little bit unusual in her eyes, perhaps. Um, but if she were to uh, walk into the room and she didn't show her hands and she had a hat on, so you didn't know she didn't have ears, I, I think you could she would pass as a normal human, actually, even though she's not. Now we were going to see something about Wawita. And uh, so the team was so impressed by what Mario was bringing in that he said, guess what? I got another, I, I got a pr another surprise for you. So he, he had the whole team move down south, closer to Nazca. Uh, where they went to the secret place. I, I might have been in his home. I don't know. In fact, I think it was his home. Um, and up in the balcony, up in the, um, yeah, it was like a patio or balcony, is where they, they brought out some more bodies. But anyway, this is what they brought out. This is, is called Wawita, Wawita. It's a baby and was determined to be somewhere between one and a half and two years old. It was badly damaged, it, it, you know, a lot of broken bones and things. And it was, Marie, Mario said that uh, Wawita was found near uh, Maria. And so the assumption was that Wawita was Maria's baby. And here is an image of Wawita. And uh, it's hard to tell, but a lot of broken bones. But per first cut, it looks like she has three fingers and three toes. But on a closer analysis, it was determined that no, she had her feet and hands had been altered to look like she was tridactyl. That some bones, or some like the fingers and toes, had been removed for some reason. It's, I don't know why. Um, and I, I can put together a science fiction story where where Maria lands on Earth, falls in love with a human, has a baby. And the baby doesn't have three fingers and looks ugly that way. And maybe they adjusted it to make look like she had three fingers. I don't know. But anyway, the, the other thing uh, is when they did the carbon dating, there's about a thousand years difference between these two. So that was another reason that they kind of forgot about even thinking that Wawita was her baby. So here you can see uh, some bones that showed that maybe some other bones were removed. So here's some observations by Dr. Benitez. Um, he says the, his analysis was done based on the X-ray images and tomography images. And his conclusion was it's not possible to assemble bones like this uh, since the size of each bone and the length of each bone has a specific purpose and these bones match the purpose. Also, he said if the alterations had been made after death, the tissue would not have regenerated and the scar of the or points of the union would be noticed. Um, so very recently in April, 2023, they found a, a new body was brought forward. I don't know how long ago they actually found it, but it was brought forward and they named him Artemis. Uh, he was also tridactyl and bipedal. And uh, he's a little taller. He's about almost four feet tall. He's 1.15 meters tall. Uh, he had four eggs in his abdomen and seven metal plates distributed throughout his body. And theory seems to think that Artemis might be hermaphrodite. In other words, have both male and female reproductive organs. Uh, to date, they have not done, uh, in fact, I just talked to Jaime this morning 
and uh, asked him if they had uh, DNA and carbon dating yet. And he said they don't have it yet. So if, I can't give you any more information on these on this body. But more to come. And this is what he looked like. Here and here. That's all I've got for that. Anyway, I, I want to talk a little bit about carbon dating now uh, because it's important, especially when you're trying to date something that um, may not have lived its whole life on Earth. So what happens is in our upper atmosphere, which is rich in nitrogen, uh, high energy particles convert hydrogen nitrogen 14 into carbon 14. And that's an isotope of carbon and it's radioactive. And, uh, but it filters down and mixes with carbon-12 in the atmosphere. It has a half-life of 5,730 years. And the ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12 is known for various locations around the, the world and also various periods of time. So there's a database that is established. So here's the thing. Once uh, we, we always take in carbon-14 every day while we drink water or eat or smell or whatever. Um, and so do trees and so do all the organic organisms generally, uh, they take in carbon-14 and that's the reason you can use carbon-14 dating on those, those species. But anyway, what happens in this process is that they measure the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. And they know that once this thing died, whether it was an, an animal or a tree, once it died, it stopped taking in carbon-14 so the, and at that point, the carbon-14 uh, ratio would, would decline and it's predictable rate because we know that the half-life is 5,730 years. And so that's how they dated these bodies is with carbon-14. <clears throat> but the major assumption is that they, let, they spent their whole life on Earth. If indeed uh, Maria came from some other planet uh, where she wasn't exposed to carbon-14 that much, she would not have as much in her body. And therefore, she would appear older than she really is. And maybe she'd only be 670 years old, just like baby Wawita, who did spend its whole life on this planet. Um, so that's why I said that the, 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 fetus, the thesis inside of uh, Maria should be carbon dated to really know when she died. Because it probably, whatever it was that she ate, probably spent its whole life on Earth. And it would give you a good dating mechanism for Maria, even though they took samples from the skin and bones. Uh, it, it, we still have to make the assumption, if we believe those numbers, that Maria spent her life on Earth. So here's a summary of the carbon dating. Uh, the hands that I showed you died about 1,205 years ago. Uh, the reptile-like bodies, like Alberto and all those, about 790 years ago. Victoria, which I did not show you, but the, another one of that family anyway, about a thousand years ago. Maria, uh, 1750 years ago. And they did, they took samples from different parts of her body, which was important, like her finger and her body. And they both had showed the same dating. And that was important to show that she was not assembled, that, that uh, she, she was intact. Yeah. Wawita supposedly died 670 years ago. And what I just said earlier, if if they really dated the uh, feces inside of Maria, they might find that Maria died 670 years ago, too. Anyway, um, it's interesting to note that the Nazca lines that everybody knows about um, are, have been dated to be about 1,700 years ago. So as far as DNA results, uh, here you can see uh, the surgeon, Dr. Vivanco, taking a specimen uh, from Maria and put it in a container to be sent off for DNA. Uh, they took a body a sample from her body, her finger, and her toe. And uh, the results indicate that another thing that they found in the DNA analysis was that uh, D she, uh, Maria has an X chromosome, and thus she truly was a female. So that proved it. Anyway, these samples were taken uh, to different laboratories, four different countries, Russia, Canada, United States, and Mexico for DNA analysis. Uh, one of the problems that, that they encountered was this is ancient, known as ancient DNA. DNA 
can degrade for various reasons, um, either the temperature uh, or um, this, the environment um, over time. And so it's, re it's really hard when you are trying to do a DNA analysis of something that's really old and requires special skills. But nevertheless, they managed to come up with a number and it's approximately 24% human-like DNA for Maria and about 26% for Wawida. But none, none of this DNA matched modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens. <clears throat> In Canada, they got some analysis of the smaller bodies uh, and they said, guess what? The, they can't match that DNA to any living organism that's in the database. That includes microorganisms, bacteria, or even different primates and turtles. Um, so th their DNA, <clears throat> the little bodies don't match anything. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, some of the DNA analysis, and this, this is the one from St. Petersburg, Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, confirmed that Maria's samples were all from the same body. Okay, I think I showed you that too. Uh, Maria's DNA had to be tested against the library of, of genes. That's what they're suggesting. Um, also, members of the team reached out to the Peruvian archaeologist during this whole six-year process, hoping that they would come join them and, and help them. But they flatly refused, even as late as October 2019, when the bodies ended up in uh, Ica. Uh, there were no archaeologists that came forward to participate. So anyway, so those metal implants, here's an analysis on that. There's the one in the wrist of the hands and also the, the, the plate in Josephina. The breastplate turned out to be 85% pre-Columbian period technology. Okay, um, the, rest, the, the wrist implant was a mixture of 60% gold 30% silver, 10% copper mixed with osmium, which is interesting because osmium is a very rare transition element. It's sometimes today alloyed with platinum and used for surgical implants. And when I say rare, the world production is about one ton, US ton per year. And mostly of it comes out of Turkey. So how did that show up in South America? Uh, the mummification process is not like what was done uh, in, in uh, Egypt, um, where the, all the internal organs were removed. Um, these bodies were all coated with a coating of diatomaceous earth uh, and a mixture with cad cadmium and some sort of oil to give adhesion to the bodies. Where diatomaceous earth is actually a fossilized remains of diatoms that existed in ancient seas. And it's an excellent desiccant, an excellent fungicide, and an excellent insecticide. I have personally used it around the foundation of my house to protect me from termites and things. Um, the, the cadmium that was in there, cadmium is very toxic and uh, it does not occur naturally. And in fact, it was not manufactured until 200 years ago. So how did the cadmium get there? That's a question. So Dr. Krotkoff from Russia believed that there was a vegetable substance that he detected when he was examining uh, Maria. And it reminded him apparently of something that he had smelled or encountered apparently when he was examining bodies, mummies in, in Egypt. He thought that was whatever it was, it was something the Egyptians had used. Well, finally, uh, the bodies find, are in a safe place. They're now down at the University of Ica as of November 6, 2019, um, maybe slightly before that. But there was a conference that I went down to uh, and attended. It was a medical conference that occurred in, at the University of Ica. And um, it, the purpose of the meeting was actually for, for uh, doctors or researchers in the medical profession to, to present their papers. But Jaime had managed to, to get him, their team put on the agenda. And here I am with Jaime and, and the biologist waiting for our ride down to Ica. Um, and this is the night before the, the meeting, the conference. 
And uh, so on my right side was Jaime Masson. On my left was the biologist. On Jaime's right side was Joyce Mantilla, who is a go-to person now in this project. He's he's a retort, reporter from Peru. And if you want to know what's going on, he's the one to contact. Oh, I should say, I want to go back here. Uh, it was quite an experience traveling with Jaime, especially in South America. He is very famous. And at least half a dozen times, people would come over to the table and want to get pictures <laughs> with Jaime. Well, here's the conference up on stage. You can see the person with the white hair, that's Jaime. And his, there's three or four team members from his presentation. And in the audience, you can see people with white shirts in that area. Uh, those, I think, were for the most part, were archaeologists. Because when Jaime and his team made their presentation, all they did was hiss and boo and show their disdain for the whole concept <laughs> of these bodies being real. If you go down to Ica University to see the bodies, uh, here I am in the hallway looking through a window into a secure room, and inside the room is a, a box that she's in, and she's she's uh, in an uh, argon environment. So they're doing what they can to preserve her. And here is uh, Alberto. He's also in uh, a, a casket, you might say, a glass casket under argon, but he's covered also in um, diatomaceous earth. So this is what you would see if you go down there. But supposedly there's about 20 scientists working on these bodies. Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, so I have a hard time keeping up with what's going on down there. Uh, here is uh, the day I left. Uh, I always give out my book <laughs> and that's my marketing. But anyway, you seem to appreciate it. So now I want to spend a little time, and I'm glad I had this opportunity to talk about some bad press that's very recently surfaced, at least for me. I've a number of times had people come up to me and talk about how these bodies were fake. Um, and here's what happened, in my opinion, anyway. If you recall, there, there, there was a conference, hell, I'm not conference, but a investigation or hearing that the uh, Congress of uh, Mexico held. And here, here's a picture of it. And if you remember, they warned that uh, there were people out there that were trying to claim the bodies were frauds and, and they would use uh, dolls and fake bodies as a result of that. Anyway, so that the, the Congress met on the 13th of September, 20, I'm sorry, 2023. I got to change that. 2023 is when they met in September. Um, however, in January of 2024, um, there was a press conference held in the Archaeology Museum in Lima, and it was conducted by a forensic archaeologist, supposedly, Flavio Estrada, from the Peru's uh, prosecutor's office. So he held this big press conference, and he displayed these bodies here, which are clearly dolls, fake. Anyway, um, there was press there, and press ate it up. So on January 15th, one reporter stated, and that was the same day after the meeting, uh, his, the bold headlines were totally made up story. Mystery of Peru alien corpses finally solved. Another reported that he, being Estrada, uh, said that the objects were made with paper, glue, metal, and human and animal bones. And Ostra Estrada also said, uh, and, and went on to say, to indicate that the uh, seized pieces were constructed of bones and animals from this planet. Estrada insisted that it's a total made-up story and blambasted the pseudoscientists who have been putting forth fantastic explanations for their origins. The day, next day, uh, another reporter stated, Estrada insisted that it's a totally made-up story. And he went on to say, Although the dolls showcased at the event on Friday were not specifically connected to the purported alien remains that were revealed to the Mexican Congress by ufologist Jamie Masson back in October, actually it was September, their shared per Peruvian point of origin as well as their strikingly similar appearance would seem to suggest that the latter specimens are also figurines. Now that's a pretty, pretty much of a big leap in logic or illogic. 
And I think that might be one reason why the, that press got out and it's circulating. And somehow we need to put an end to that, I think. Anyway, I would like to thank uh, Theories of Mean for initiating this project. He's the one that received the bodies to begin with, realized they were real, and uh, spent a lot of time and energy uh, and expense, got support, you know, GoFundMe. I think some friends of his in France uh, opened up a website with a GoFundMe because a lot of the research was thousands of dollars for the DNA and carbon-14. And so Theory did a good job of getting some of that done. And I would like to like uh, thank uh, Jaime and his team at uh, Terso Malino um, for inviting me along on this trip down to Peru and also raising the public awareness of this fantastic discovery. And I would like to thank Gaia.com for their financial support. At the time, Jaime said he knew they spent hundreds of thousands to, to help on the research and their willingness to produce and air movies documenting this project. So if you're interested in this project, I would tell you, go to the Gaia.com and search for the series that they did on this whole project. Um, I also want to thank all of these scientists who risked their reputation by being involved in this project because obviously it was taboo and they were risking their reputation. I would like to thank Dr. Konstantin Karatkov for his book, which he wrote in 2019, documenting this project. And with in the last third of the book is, is uh, all these computer tomography images, and they're analyzed by Dr. Galecki, uh, and he, he gave his interpretation of these images in that book. And recently, Thury Shamin has come out with his book in 2022, and it's a great book we're documenting historically the events uh, and the, what that occurred from the time he received the uh, the bodies until today, more or less, well, until 2022. Uh, these are the book, two books. Uh, if you read both of them, you've got a pretty complete story of this project. And I was going to write my own book on the science behind the mysterious mummies of Nazca, Peru. But after I read both these books, basically anything I would say would be kind of redundant because Almost all the information you would need is in these two books. I also write nonfiction books, so I might as well promote myself here. I have the science behind alien encounters and the science behind Noah's flood. I also have a science fiction series, um, starting with Alien Law that I wrote 20 years ago, all the way through to Alien Law 4, which came out last year. And I wanted to say something about Alien Law. Um, I published that book in 20, in 2003. And, uh, the way I got this cover design, I, I happened to be at a UFO conference and they were selling bus of, of the aliens, uh, the, the grays as they're called. And I thought, so I bought one to take home and maybe take my camera, my digital camera and create my cover. But I noticed on the box was the website of the artist who, who made the bus. And so I went to his website, and there is that picture you're looking at. That's his website. And I said, holy Mac, th that's what I want. So I called him to get permission, and he gave me permission to use that image on my business card and my books. So I asked him, I said, how did you come out, come up with that image? And he said that he, he contacted 12 people that he knew uh, had, had contact with Grays, and he asked them to send him a sketch of what they remembered they looked like. And he took those sketches and created two composite images and sent them back out to the witnesses and asked them to vote and uh, on those two images. And what you're seeing right here is the image that they voted for as, as being the most like what they remembered the grays would look like. And it's interesting, the bodies we just looked at today, uh, the little bodies, um, sure look like the image you see of the grays uh, in many respects. And I, I find that amazing, actually. And the, I wrote that book, actually, 21 years ago, based on information that I had uh, gleaned also. Anyway, that is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope that uh, you, you now can believe that these bodies are for real. Thank you. The end. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Robert. That was fascinating. Let me see if I can get, if you wanna go ahead and um, remove that, or I think maybe I can just remove you. Um, David, in the meantime, or did you have some questions you wanted to start asking? And I'll see if I can get our pictures back up on here. Sure, yes, yeah, so many. Um, you know, but the first thing I wanna say is that this is why you reserve judgment on something. <laughs> especially something that's controversial. And by that, I mean, there were the initial claims, right, by Mosan and, and his team. And then there came the, the misinformation, because it's always coming, you know, for something this controversial. <clears throat> and you can't stop there. You have to seek out an expert like the one we have here, Robert Farrell, to get the real story. Because most people, if they had any clue this was going on in the beginning, they wrote it off completely when they saw the, those were just dolls claims. And I have to admit, I was one of those people who said, yeah, prop." I mean, they look very similar. It probably was just dolls. Somehow I was able to uh, come to that conclusion, <clears throat> even though I should know better because I've been looking at this kind of stuff for decades, you know? I mean, you, you talk about Roswell or 9-11 or the Phoenix Lights or uh, cold fusion, you know, you telling me about the archaeologists refusing to look even mm -hmm. reminded me of the cold fusion, uh, you know, explosion that happened in 89, right? It's been decades. Yeah. And there were invitations, open invitations to come to the labs to see mm -hmm. these experiments in operation. And the invitations were refused. It's like the you know the classic tale, whether it's true or not. Uh, looking into Galileo's telescope, and the uh, I've read that it's not really true how it happened, but the, the the disbelievers didn't want to even look in the telescope. That's what I see happening here, and so to reserve judgment until you hear the rebuttal to the rebuttal is what I'm saying. And uh, Robert today has given quite a rebuttal because. Now I'm convinced. I suppose I should wait and hear what the skeptics say at this point. But when you have DNA results in your favor, uh, when you have these uh, MRI, the X-ray, and you see actual bones in these things and very telltale, uh, telltale biological features that clearly cannot be faked, and you have the presence of what was it, osmium and cadmium, when you, you get an abundance of evidence leaning in that direction, you have no choice but to, to sit up and take notice and, and pay attention to how the story unfolds because that's stuff that you can't, uh, you can't easily fake that stuff. So I'm, I'm fully um, back into the story personally, and I hope that our uh, uh, viewers are also. So let me ask a few questions though. Um, so these dolls that were trotted out, do you think they were created specifically for this disinformation, um, you know, press conference, this, this effort to disc discredit all these very well-credentialed scientists or were, are they in existence somewhere and they happen to be very close to, to, you know, some of the real specimens here? What about these dolls? Where did they come from? That's a good question. I asked the same thing. Actually, that story started when uh, these dolls uh, were intercepted in an airport uh, in Peru, supposedly bound for Mexico, but they were intercepted and ended up in the hands of uh, the prosecutor, basically. Uh, and they were intercepted several months before, I think, I can't remember now the date, but it was two or three months before the, they did the press conference. They had been intercepted, yeah. um, hmm. and but they were they were fake. I, in fact, I talked to Jaime this morning because I had the same question. I said, well, "What? How did this happen?" Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and I know the press even said that these bodies had been intercepted at the airport. Um, and he said, "Well, they were actually they were fake, and they were being sent uh, to somebody in Mexico. Nobody seems to know who." And said th they weren't real bodies. They didn't. I actually claim they were uh, so but anyway so now the archaeologist expert in, in ministry culture or, or 
wherever he's from, uh, is is able to use this now to <clears throat> as further evidence that these bodies are fake. Well, how convenient. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I, I'm worried about it because uh, just in the last few days, you know, I was at the pool yesterday and I happened to be looking through uh, the book written by Dr. Krutkoff and, and the, because there's all these images in the back, computer tomography images, and somebody came by and said, oh, that's interesting. So I started telling them about it. And first of all, I said, well, you know, we, we heard about that. They're all fake. <laughs> now, oh. they're, they're just strangers that heard about that. Mm -hmm. Somebody is really spreading the, the fake news. Uh, pretty quickly, and I don't know where it's going, but uh, hopefully enough people start watching this video, and uh, and maybe somebody else comes up with talks too uh, that, that convince people. But you you almost need to have the images. I, I I can't imagine standing up and just preaching to someone that all well, these bodies are are real. They've been DNA tested and all that. I don't think that would convince you. Mm -hmm. You really have to see the tomography images to be convinced. I think. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I happen to believe because Jaime was behind it at the very beginning. So I've been following that ever since 2017. And I was contacting him off and on because it was that period of time for two years when the bodies were wandering around, they were being hidden. And uh, and I, I kept saying, well, where are they now? I mean, said, so, well, university was going to take them. And then, but then the, the, the staff of the, in the archaeologist department said, don't take them and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So finally, they ended up in the University of Ica, and he told me that uh, they were going to have the conference. So I asked him if I could join, and he let me join. But uh, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how how you, this information, how else it can get out there. As far as I know, I'm the only one in the United States lecturing on this topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that shouldn't be. Mm -mm. The it's information is available. A worldwide sensation based mm -hmm. on what you've uh, yeah. shown here in the last hour or so. And well, you know, uh, when I was heading, getting ready to head down to ICA for the conference, I actually notified a contact I had in uh, New York, who happens to be very familiar with ancient DNA. It's his specialty. And I said, you know, these bodies are going to be seen. Would you like to come along? And he declined. <laughs> and I, I think these guys are so afraid of being stigmatized mm -hmm. by somehow getting associated with something that's fake that, that they don't want to take a chance. Well, you know, I'm done. I'm retired. Doesn't matter if I yeah. they can't fire me, right? <laughs> yep, that's how it goes. They can't take away my retirement. I hope, but anyway, <laughs> you have you have less to lose now. You know, compared. I do, to so I can take a chance. Yep. I'll stick to Nico. But but the people who do have a lot to lose, this panel of experts, and they appear to be well-established veteran experts in most cases. Yeah, they have a lot to lose. The fact that they're sticking with this. Yeah says something and and again i'm stuck on the dna part i mean you yeah dna is in terms of scientific evidence dna is fairly indisputable right yeah. and for sure yeah. dolls don't have dna so all we have to do is check for dna on the supposed dolls and, right and and compare them to the results that show actual dna and very anomalous dna at that yeah so, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, like, for instance, if I went on coast to coast, I could not sell that on coast to coast because it requires the images, mm -hmm. you know. So radio is not the place to do it. YouTube is probably going to be a place. It's put out enough YouTubes by other people who discuss yeah. the, with the images uh, might convince people. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, they might. It's well, go, just, go ahead, Gwen. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely fascinating, Robert. Thank you so much for bringing this. Um, wow. Um, well, I think it's obvious when people say what they just recently saw or back in September when it was of the dolls. Obviously, those are fake. OK, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, right. obvious. those are fake. And, you know, my first thought when I heard about it was, oh, maybe somebody's making a bunch of stuff just to sell it to tourists yeah. or something. But obviously that's fake. But I mean, come on. Um, the rest of it just can't be. We don't know what it is, maybe, but just because we don't know what it is doesn't mean that it's not, that it wasn't a living being of some kind, um, which is so important to us and in humanity, all of humanity. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. So um, 
uh, I had, I'm, I am particularly, well, so many interesting things, but I guess I'm really particularly fascinated in the imp by the implants. Mm, yes. I know that you said the one that was in a wrist is, um, has various things in it, but it has gold, um, gold. Mixed you, yeah, gold and silver, uh, yes. Yeah. Gold and some other things. Now, yeah. what about the breast, the, the, what was called, you called a breastplate. Uh, you may yeah. have said what that was and I didn't write it down. Do you know what that, did they know what that was made from? Uh, I have to review my notes. I think it was copper mostly. Oh, I think it, you might've said copper. Yeah, yes. it, it was, it was technology that was available back a thousand years back, ago. Back then. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah. pro they thought maybe it was pounded out, you know, by working it, they, that's how they made the, the shape by pounding. Sure, it was soft. Yeah, yeah, that copper's fairly soft. You could work yeah. it out, work it like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, another thing that interested me was Maria's uh, body um, posture, um, yes. what we would call a fetal burial posture, which we know that has has been used for a long time. It was used um, many years by many different pe peoples around, even yeah. in the United or even in the America by right. some of the Native American tribes who are here. I thought that was very interesting too to see that she was in it. And even that looked like little Wawita was had been put into some kind of a a, a shape like that. Um, that has to have cultural uh, yeah. significance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, I, I personally believe that both, with all the bodies I showed you, except for Wawita, did not originate on earth. That's my belief. And, and it fits in so well with my research and perhaps your own, mm -hmm. uh, as far as what people who've encountered the greys, how they report them acting. And uh, in fact, uh, what I did, I, I uh, my alien log number four, the Antarctica affair, mm -hmm. uh, at that time that I was writing that, the hot topic was what's going on in Antarctica. And of course, I had just come back from Peru where I saw these bodies. So I married the two together. So those small reptilians are maintaining a mothership buried under a thousand feet of ice in Antarctica. And if you read my book, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so Maria, then you would consider a mummy because she had internal organs intact. Yes. As opposed well, to the others that you said, they're not mummies. Well, no, no none of them are mummies. Uh, the, the, apparently the, the, the classification for a mummy, and I, I really should look it up with them going by what Jaime had said when he made his presentation back in 2017, he says these are not hummy, mummies because uh, they still have their internal organs. Real mummies, like in Egypt, they remove the internal mm -hmm. organs, and those are mummies. I so see. technically, oh, I see. technically so it's just the opposite. It's just the mm -hmm. opposite. Technically, these are not mummies, but everybody knows them as the mummies. So if you mm -hmm. want them to understand what you're talking about, you got to kind of start off with the mummies yeah. are not of Nazca. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very, very interesting. Um, uh, David. But they have undergone, I mean, there's a mummification process, right? Or multiple ways to preserve a body. And these bodies appear to have been, somebody wanted to preserve them. Yes. Somebody understood their, their importance, probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, why else would you do that? And yeah. they used a fairly... Uh, advanced way to do it or the way that was available then. Yeah. And apparently it worked. Yeah. All the, all the bodies, everything that, that they received had been coated with diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. Now, whether all of them had cadmium mixed in or not, I don't know, but they did detect cadmium in a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the other thing that's fascinating about this sort of uh, really cutting edge discovery is that you can have physical specimens, you can have all this fancy, very expensive analysis done, and you still don't have agreement, probably among even the experts working on everything, but certainly not in the scientific fields. Uh, you don't, I mean, what else can you do to get people to pay attention to something like this? It's to their own detriment that they don't pay attention to this, because mm -hmm. if it comes out that this is a, a monumental discovery, and you realize that you were one of the ones in the beginning saying, oh, that's nothing. You know, I ignored it for 10 years. That's embarrassing to a professional. So at some point, the professionals start thinking, maybe I should jump on this bandwagon. I mean, clearly we aren't to that point yet, but 
at what point, Robert, do you think that that happens where there's some sort of um, kind of mad rush to get in on this discovery? Or do you think it will ever happen in this case? Well, uh, it's interesting. First of all, you, you, the, the bodies ended up in uh, University of Ica. And supposedly there's 20 scientists working on that. I don't know, but I've been told that. But now also at the um, in, in College of Engineering, I think it's called in Lima, the National Engineering College or some such like, also is researching these bodies mm. and, and research on them. And I was also told that there's a university uh, in the U.S. who's researching this. And I've asked a theory of mean who it is, and he doesn't know. And I asked Jaime, what university is studying these bodies? And they don't know. And I figure, well, maybe nobody, again, maybe they don't want to be stigmatized, so nobody's advertising that they're doing these studies, if they are. I mean, I don't know. That's the problem. And I don't mm -hmm. speak Spanish, so I have a hard time trying to communicate with people down in ICA who are doing the research. Um, and like I mentioned, the go-to person now is Joyce Mantilla. He's a reporter in Peru. He's been in the center of the whole thing. And every, when I talk to Jaime and ask him a question, he'll say, well, talk to Joyce. Mm hmm well, I, I don't know. I don't think Joyce speaks English and I don't speak Spanish. And I realize there's ways to get around that. You know, these phones can do translations and all. It's just awkward. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's yeah. been difficult to kind of stay up to date with what's going on. But um, there are two, at least two universities that are doing study. So and this, this is approaching that dangerous ground, I think, um, where things either things can disappear in an unsatisfying manner, left uh, cliffhangers everywhere. They disappear yeah. into a black project somewhere or whatever. That's what mm -hmm. I'm afraid will happen here. Or yeah. they just get left in a warehouse a la, um, you know, Indiana Jones and the- Is that exactly Temple right. Doom, you know, the, no, the Ark of the Covenant is sitting in a, a warehouse somewhere and everyone's forgotten about it. That's, that's what I worry about in this particular- well, that that's exactly right. That's why Jaime. You know, I know when I went down to the to the uh, conference that night that we were having dinner, Joyce was sitting next to him and was telling me he's, he says Jaime, you know, I understand they're going to arrest you tomorrow. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he said um, that I've heard that threat before, probably. Well, and and the thing mm -hmm. is, that they're definitely afraid that the Ministry of Culture will get their hands on the bodies because guess where they'll end up in that warehouse. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so, so, but what, what theory was trying to do at the very beginning was to, to get them to acknowledge that, yes, these were a tremendous find and, and a, a, a great, perhaps, national heritage, and we should preserve them, protect them, and research them. And not only that, but we should declare the site where they've been found is, is off bounds for, mm -hmm. for great workers, basically. And that's what, he, that's what theory was trying to have happen, but it didn't happen. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got I've got one more thing. I'll throw it back to Gwen. I'm sure we're we're over time or we're approaching time. We want to respect your mm -hmm. time too, Robert. Um, I want to say, uh, trying to put on my skeptic hat here, which which is considerably smaller than my other hats, I think, mm -hmm. in in a lot of these areas. But yeah, the horde of items. First of all, I you know, what was the name of the discoverer again? Mario. That's a pseudo name pseudonym uh, yeah. for the discoverer. His, his real name. In fact, if you read uh, uh, Thierry's book, which is really good uh, okay. historical documentation, uh, he finally finds out the real name. It's in that okay. book. And so it'd be very I'm interesting. Use... What's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be very interesting to hear the genesis of that story too, who this person is, where they came from, how they yes. got on. That's in, uh, that's in, that's in, is uh, it in the book? It, it's in um, it's in uh, Theory's book. Okay. Like I said, Theory does a great job of laying out the whole story. In Karatkov's book, the last third of it is when there's an analysis done, and it's full of all these images that I showed you, not all of them, but similar okay. images, where there's a scientific opinion discussing each of those in images. From You almost have to be a doctor to understand what he's saying because it's in you know medical okay. terms. Mm -hmm. I, and so, like I said, I, I was going to write my own book, but it would be <laughs> redundant. And you, if you get those two books together, you got the whole story, pretty much. 
Great. That's amazing. Right. It's rare to have such an easy uh, way to encapsulate an entire complicated phenomenon. And that might be the way to do it for people who are interested. Yeah. Uh, my question, though, is that this horde of items um, discovered by Mario here, you said mm -hmm. the DNA testing or the carbon dating, um, not the DNA, but the carbon dating, or maybe both. Anyway, it varied by up to a thousand years or so. Mm -hmm. Those various objects or biological specimens that were discovered, how would you account for such a wide, um, you know, span of time uh, between those certain items? I mean, how do you have one here and you're waiting a thousand years for the next one? Or did you acquire them from different places and bring them to one cave? And I mean, what, what are your speculations on why that those dates vary that widely? Or is it a, an error in the measurements? I would say the latter. If they didn't come from this planet, all that carbon dating is invalid. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. If yeah. And carbon dating has some limitations for sure yes, anyway. Yeah. But that... it, would make things, it would make things look older if they didn't spend their life on Earth. Or I could even argue maybe younger if they lived in a place that had even more carbon-14 that they inhaled, you know? Right. But, uh, so it all depends where they came from. Mm. But uh, I don't think it, uh, I think it's, it's, it's wrong to not consider the fact that they may not have lived their life, the total life on, on Earth. I mean, first of all, there's been nothing else like that in, in the, the history, the evolutionary history, other than the, those little uh, dinosaurs that, had three fingers. I can't remember what they're called. Mm -hmm. I, I normally have those in my slide too, but I had to take a lot of stuff out in order to put it inside <laughs> your uh, time frame. Well, it was a very compact presentation. I mean, it had a ton of stuff in it, but there mm -hmm. were no uh, there were no lulls. It was just then this happened, this happened, this happened. Here's the evidence, and it's very well put together. Thank so you. I appreciate that. That's a very um, informative and our audience will eat it up i i think i hope so mm -hmm. i hope they start spreading the word <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we don't want to keep you much longer today robert um but i want to ask one final question and um do you know because gaia was so involved um previously and put a lot of money into the project do you know if they have made a comment about the sec the news that came out in September and September about the possible fake um, dolls. Have you do you know if they made any comment or taken a position on it? Uh, I I do not know. When I was thinking about writing my own book because it's required so much graphical images to be in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, it's one thing to you know put on a YouTube or something like that. But when you write a book, the images, you have to make sure you have permission for every one of them. Absolutely. And I tried to track down who owned those images for at least two years. I <laughs> called Gaia and nobody there seemed to know who. And I uh, I even called Jaime and I'm not sure I got a good answer from him. But Theory actually gave me a good answer that he had. He yeah. owned the images mm -hmm. and he even sent me a lot of them with permission to use them. But like I said, now I'm not, I got other things I want to do. There's other books I want to write, like the universe book, I call it, or the mm -hmm. gravity book, which is about developing gravity. To me, I'm going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you've made a good start here for us, and I know we'll have many viewers who will enjoy this. Um, there are some other organizations who might be interested in it as well, but yeah. I do understand you have a lot of interests and a lot of energy and things that you want to look at. And we want to hear what you have to say about those other things as well. So before we go, um, is there a website or some way that people can reach you if they want to know more? Well, you know, I do have a website, which I have not maintained. Uh, so it's probably about five or six years out of date, but it is there. I think I think I still have it. My daughter was managing that for me, and she lives in Austria now. Um, but and I used to have a info at Alien Log, okay. and I think that still works. Although I don't know how to monitor it. My daughter actually informs me when when something crops up, a question by somebody, 
she forwards it to me from Austria and then I try and respond. So, uh, and I don't like to give out my phone number necessarily. Of course, of course uh, not. Uh, I get enough uh, calls from people who want to buy my house or do this. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I would say try info at Alien Log. I, I really should be better prepared to get that answer because I, that's a good question. Well, we can all Google these days. It's not it's not a big deal. But if you have somewhere to specifically direct interest, then we always want to ask that uh, or contact yeah. info or whatever. But we've we've got enough uh, references that you've given us to keep us busy for a long time. Yeah, actually, when thinking, has your number? Yeah, I'm just thinking. If you hold on a second, I'm going to look at my bookshelf. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, and while we're taking a little pause here. Um, do we have some upcoming features that we need to talk about? I think I've got a couple on the calendar here, David. Um, I'm looking at, um, we're going to March, I think. Um, shall we just maybe throw those in right now? Are you ready? Are you ready, Robert? Uh, have yeah, I, this is my first book and I'm looking in the back and actually I, I said, he can be reached, that's me, through <laughs> author, at alienlog.com. And apparently that still works. Okay. Because my, my, my daughter at alienlog.com. Okay, right. good. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Robert, today. This has been fascinating and I know people are going to enjoy it. And I'm I'm definitely going to go back and watch it again when I can pay a little bit more attention uh, okay. to what you're saying. We really appreciate it. And mm -hmm. before we go today, we we'd like to just mention a couple of our upcoming um, interviews that we're going to be doing with people, and uh, then we will be saying goodbye. So I believe we have on um, March the 8th, we have an interview with Rhonda and Dwight Hall. Rhonda's been on the show before. This time, we're going to talk about the ghosts of the Southwestern United States. Um, mm -hmm. She and her husband, Dwight, have co-authored a couple books on that topic. And we recently talked about ghosts of the Northwest. So now we're going to look at the Southwest. So that should be really interesting. I think it's, you know, we need to have our, our time there. And then on the 13th of March, we'll be interviewing Stan Gordon, who I think is going to be talking about the Kecksburg UFO, which is a, a very famous one. Well, I thought and you were going to say Phoenix Lights because that's the anniversary, right? That March is the, the anniversary of Phoenix Lights. And we haven't got anybody on the show, but we're working on that mm. too. So uh, any anything else that you know of, David, that we need to talk about? Uh, you know, those are the ones I had. So I think we're, okay. <laughs> we've got uh, our, our agenda set. But I also want to say uh, to Robert that when you get updates, we would sure love to have, even if it's just a more brief uh, discussion here, we'd love to hear what you uh, what you hear, because, you know, you're an insider compared to us, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you may run across right information <laughs> that you need. You need so, to pass along or have us pass along to the listeners to keep everyone active in this, because if you don't pay attention to it, it these things can fade away yeah. forever. We need to pay well, attention to where it goes. I, I had uh, on my bucket list was to go back to Peru because there's a lot of interesting things to see there. But I don't know if if, uh, if the Ministry of Culture watches this YouTube, they're probably going to put a, a watch for this guy coming across the border, I think I'll never, never get out of Peru. I'll die there. <laughs> you might need to get a disguise of some kind. So you might yeah. start working on that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, Robert Farrell, Dr. Robert Farrell, thanks again for such a fun and amazing presentation today. We just loved having you and would love to have you again sometime. And so we're going to say goodbye to everybody now. Hope everybody is well and stay warm and safe. And we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.